Okay, so uh, we can get started. I think no, uh, Reshma needs no introduction. I'm Roger Hajar. Tazeen is here also. Hi, I'm Tazeen Ahmad from Bank of America. So, uh, Reshma, if you don't mind, we can get in straight into uh, uh, first questions we have. Um, Vertex is among uh, the highest quality names, as we've heard, uh, in large cap biotechs. Um, one of the questions is, after the, the, the sort of great success in uh, CF therapies, what's next for Vertex? How do you maintain uh, innovation and how do you maintain that drive towards novel therapeutics uh, in, in that environment? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for, for hosting this panel. Um, as we were talking about on the, the previous panel, the real drive for Vertex is to invest in serial innovation, not just do it once, but do it repeatedly within a disease area like CF. We started with a medicine, gosh, 15 years ago that treated 4% of the CF population, and now we are at a point where we can treat 90% of people with CF with our medicines. And the goal there is to get to all 100% of the patients with cystic fibrosis, which is gonna require nucleic acid therapy because that last 10% doesn't make enough protein to respond to small molecules. But the goal here is also to learn all of the lessons that we have from CF and to invest in other disease areas. The next franchise after cystic fibrosis, as some of you might know, is in hematology for diseases um, like sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia using CRISPR-Cas9 therapy, which is a partnership between Vertex and CRISPR. And the medicine after that and the franchise after that I expect to be in the pain arena. And if you ask, gosh, well, how do you do it? What is the, the secret sauce? I'll tell you the five pillars of our R&D strategy. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit uh, more about why we're so freely sharing that because the next question is, gosh, if you tell us what the pillars of your R&D strategy are, isn't everyone gonna do the same thing? And, and the real answer is the strategy is critical, but the discipline to execute faithfully on that strategy is the really, really hard thing. So it's really five elements. One, we only pursue diseases with high unmet need, but I think most good companies do that. The second filter, and it gets narrow and narrow as we go down, is that we only go after diseases where we have validated targets, usually genetic, but pharmacologic is just fine. We only do diseases where we have biomarkers that translate from the bench to bedside, so you will not find a program where we don't have a biomarker that is the readout for the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Next is the fact that we only go after diseases with efficient regulatory and development pathways. And one of the reasons for that is we look for large treatment effects, as in the treatment effect has to be transformative, if not curative. And that allows us to quickly and efficiently make our way through development. And lastly, I include this in our R&D strategy, is that we only go after disease areas where the use is in specialty markets. And that is important to us because we have an investment philosophy that is low investment in SGNA so that we can disproportionately invest in R&D. Great, that's, uh, that's really refreshing to hear in terms of uh, the world that we live in now in pharmaceuticals where a lot of Me Too therapies are, are come on board just because of uh, specific uh, investment targets. But does he? So thanks for that intro, Reshma. Um, so the world knows you as the CF company, but as you said, you've got several other areas of focus now. One of those, as you mentioned, is pain management. Yeah. Um, needless to say, the world has become you know, painfully aware of the need for alternatives to opioids. So you have, the company has invested in pain management, first potentially in acute pain management starting late or early next year, should you right. get approved, and then over time also chronic pain. So can you talk about how you think your approach to treating pain is differentiated from, let's say, other companies who've tried in the past? And also, just given the focus um, by the government on this issue, how do you think that the alternatives to Pain Act could potentially be a 
uh, a tailwind for what Vertex is trying to do? Yeah. Let me break that question down into three parts. One, what are we doing today? What are we using today? Two, what have others tried to come up with medicines, to invent medicines that don't use the opioid pathways? And then three, what do um, uh, congressional acts like the No Pain Act mean to this disease area? So first, um, we haven't had a new medicine in acute pain in more than two decades. We haven't had a new medicine in the area of chronic pain in about that time as well. So basically, that's to say it, innovation hasn't exactly been flourishing in this area. And so by and large, the commonest use of medicines are opioids. In fact, it's a medicine whose the brand name is Norco. It's a combination of hydrocodone and acetaminophen. That is the most commonly used medicine for the treatment of acute pain in America today. Equally, I think everybody in this room, and, and frankly, most people around the country know by either a loved one who's been affected, newspaper articles, TV shows, books that have been written, or lawsuits, including from our own um, uh, Governor Healy in, in her role as Attorney General, that there is a opioid epidemic and we have to do better in terms of the management of acute pain. So that's where we are today. Vertex started its acute pain program actually more time ago than our CF program. So our CF program has been around for about 20 years or so. Our acute pain, chronic pain programs have been around for about 25 years. And it's interesting that the same exact group of scientists who worked on CF are the exact same scientists who work on the pain program. What's the big idea? The big idea here is when you use opioids, the way that those medicines work in dulling pain is not actually to take the pain away. They work in the central nervous system in the brain to alter the perception of pain. The very nature of its effectiveness, how it gets its efficacy, is exactly how it has the safety tolerability and addiction potential. So here's our idea. All pain, all known pain, is transmitted by C fibers from the peripheral nervous system centrally. How about we tackle pain peripherally? so that we don't have the safety tolerability and particularly the addictive potential of centrally acting medicines. Okay, that's a pretty good idea. In fact, it's such a good idea that targeting what is called NAV, sodium channels, NAV 1.7 and 1.8 have been called the holy grail of pain management. So it's not that Vertex is unique in thinking about the fact that we should target these peripheral channels. Where Vertex is different is we've been persisting for 25 years. These channels are so-called NAV17 and 18 because it's a family that starts at 1.1 and goes all the way up to 1.9. And you have to have exquisite selectivity for NAV17 and 1.8 so as to not affect the other channels. So lidocaine, for example, it works on 1.1, but the reason you can only use it locally is because you can't administer it systemically. 1.7 and 1.8, we're working, and we have already filed for a NAV18 to be an acute pain medicine, the PDUFA date is January 30th of 2025. So here's the one thing to maybe think about in terms of pain. NAV17 is a validated target, and there are, there's a kindred, a family in Pakistan that walks on hot coals. The reason they're able to do that is that they lack NAV17. There are other kindreds that have overexpression of NAV18, and they have constant uh, like numbness, tingling, pain sensation. So we are working, the first approach is NAV18. We have a follow-on um, in the NAV18 system as part of our serial innovation strategy. And we have a separate program in NAV17 which could be used separately or together with the NAV18s. And our goal is to fundamentally and forever change the management of pain using peripheral acting medicines so we don't have this addictive problem that we have with opioids today. You asked about the No Pain Act. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have an opioid epidemic is, is well known. And our government, state and federal, are working to find ways to curb this. Some of the ways they've done it, and for the practicing physicians in the room, you'll know this. The opioids, if you are prescribing them, 
who can prescribe them, for whom, for how long, at what dose. They're all controlled um, in an in a, if effort to reduce the use of opioids. An act that was passed by Congress in December of 2022 goes one step further and says that in a DRG environment where you could, ex you could expect that there might be a disincentive to use a new medicine that is not a generic opioid, the federal government instructed C CMS through the No Pain Act to have an add-on payment in the hospital outpatient setting and in the surgical care center setting so that there's an add-on payment to the DRG to use non-opioid pain medicines. And there's another uh, proposal going through Congress, hasn't passed yet, called the Alternatives to Pain Act that's looking to do the same thing in terms of copay and in terms of not having utilization management. That has not yet passed. And then maybe just to follow up, how do you think about the difference between the acute market and the chronic market? Yeah. So in, in the vertex way of viewing the world, we actually break the pain market into three segments, acute, neuropathic, and let's call it musculoskeletal. Neuropathic and musculoskeletal is what most people would just call chronic, but we break it down because we believe we are going to be able to discover, develop, and commercialize, and it is our full intent to do so in acute and neuropathic. I believe our medicines will indeed work for musculoskeletal pain as well, and that's not hubris talking, but the fact that we did a program with the predecessor molecule to what is called Cetragene. The predecessor molecule was called VX150, which also worked on NAV1 A channels. And we already did study in uh, osteoarthritis, and it already demonstrated efficacy. But going back to strategy, we are not looking to commercialize in uh, the primary care environment because of the investment required in SGNA, whereas our strategy is to invest in R&D. So we will get to those patients if our medicine can help them, but that will be through a partnership. Acute pain, neuropathic pain, we fully intend to discover, develop, and commercialize as Vertex. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that color. Uh, back to you, Roger. Thank you. So talking about holy grails, um, treatment of type, uh, type 1 diabetes. I mean, that is uh, obviously um, an effort that's been going on for many, many years. Now, you presented some very interesting data earlier this year. Uh, and I was wondering what was the motivation to go after such an indication? And what can you tell us about uh, the sort of R&D development for this uh, program? Yeah. So it's, it's actually a really, really interesting question because if you think about the foundation of Vertex, Vertex was established, oh, 35 years ago as a company based on the concept of structure-based drug design, i.e. small molecules. So it's very, very interesting to note that Vertex is the same company that is the first to bring CRISPR-Cas9 therapies forward to patients and we are at the leading edge of regenerative medicine or cell-based therapy for type 1 diabetes. So this program um, in type 1 diabetes has three pillars underneath it. The first is a program called VX880. Let's call it the naked cell program. So what we do here is take stem cells, coax them into differentiating into islet cells, pancreatic islet cells, that are glucose-sensing, insulin-releasing cells, kind of like what your pancreas does. Uh, in that program, uh, you need to take chronic immunosuppressives because that is, this is an allogeneic off-the-shelf therapy. The second program is the same exact cells, but we encapsulate it in a proprietary device in order to not have to use immunosuppressives. And the third program, which is still on the bench, program one and two are in the clinic already. The third program takes those same exact cells. Spoiler alert, we already know that those cells work because we've already released data, small number of patients. We have um, a limited number of uh, patients with long-term follow-up, but the data tell us that these cells already work. In the third program, we take those same cells and we look to edit those cells so as to evade the immune system, another way to obviate the need for immunosuppressants. In that first program, 
we've released um, data from uh, a number of patients. The original program was designed as a 17 patient Part A, Part B, Part C, Phase 1, 2 program. And we've released data that, that show that all four patients who have reached the one-year follow-up, all of them are insulin-free, which is remarkable for those of you who know type 1 diabetes, because if a type 1 diabetic does not take exogenous insulin for seven days or 10 days, they, they cannot live. And all of our patients who've reached the one-year milestone are indeed insulin-free. I think when we look back at this time, we're going to think about CRISPR-Cas9 as a seminal discovery and development. And I also think we're going to be in that place of thinking about a seismic shift when you think about cell-based therapy and this movement from chronic therapies to potentially curative therapies. It, it is one of the programs I, I'm most excited about. And how do you see the sort of integration of both cell and gene editing at the same time really giving you the product of choice uh, at the end of the, the road? Yeah. I think one of the advantages of being a disease-first company, which is what we consider ourselves, we're not platform-first. That is to say, we're not a company that only works with CRISPR. We're not a company that only works with mRNA or pick your favorite modality, um, ADCs. We are a company that has a set of diseases that we call, we put them into a metaf metaphorical box that we call our sandbox. There's between 12 and 24 diseases in our sandbox and we use whatever modality is needed to transform, if not cure, those diseases of interest. One of the advantages to having that approach is that we can combine modalities. In the CF area, that uh, manifests as small molecule therapies for the 90% that make enough protein for the small molecules to work, and using an mRNA approach with our partners at Moderna for the last 10%. In type 1 diabetes, it might manifest as uh, cells only with off-the-shelf small molecule immunosuppressives for chronic therapy. It could manifest as gene editing plus a device for encapsulation, it could be a transient immunosuppression with either gene editing or um, a uh, encapsulation therapy, but it allows us the opportunity to mix modalities because we are disease first. Thank you. Okay, so keeping on the theme of areas of focus, um, I guess you can say that Vertex now has potentially more shots on goal than it's had ever before with all the different programs. Um, that also, we didn't get even a chance to talk much about your preclinical program. So perhaps you could tell us about what you are excited about when you see some, some of the program data from your early um, stage efforts. And I think it, I would love to, to particularly hear about the DM1 program, if yeah. you can share any details on that. Absolutely. Um, as you can imagine, I get this question a lot in terms of uh, my favorite program, um, but I will, I will um, be neutral. I'm going to be Switzerland on this and, and not um, share uh, favorites. But let me tell you a little bit about some of the earlier stage programs that we just don't get to talk a lot about. I'll call out maybe four. Um, the DM1 program that you asked about is really very interesting. So myotonic dystrophy type 1, or DM1, is actually the most common muscular dystrophy. It's much more common than Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, for example. There are no approved therapies for this disease. And we have a very interesting approach. Again, another Boston story. We in-licensed an asset from a company called Entrada, another Boston-based company. And it is an oligo linked to a circular peptide linked to a nuclear localizing domain which um, we believe will allow this to have the kind of efficacy that is transformative for this disease, DM1, that has no approved therapy. We're in a uh, phase one, two, SAD, MAD study. We are moving through the SAD portion, and in the MAD portion of the study, we expect to be able to demonstrate both safety and efficacy, certainly evaluate both safety and efficacy. Another earlier stage program that I'll call out, we talked a little bit about Keschevy, that's the CRISPR-Cas9-based medicine for sickle cell disease beta thalassemia. There are about 150,000 people with sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia in Europe and Northern and North America. 
um, about 30,000 or so would be eligible for Cash Chevy because it requires busulfan-based Milo conditioning, which is a, a serious Milo conditioning regimen. We're working on a gentler conditioning regimen using an ADC. I'm very excited about the program, progress we're making in that program. It's still preclinical, but I do think that that is going to be something to look forward to and that would expand the availability of Cash Chevy and, and make it a, a procedure with gentler conditioning. And the last one I, I uh, already alluded to in the early stage pipeline, which is the NAV17 um, asset. And that one excites me because of the elegance of the biology. So the way the pain signal is propagated and, and the way you feel pain is the NAV17 channels kick off the action potential and NAV18 channels propagate the action potential. And so I just think it's, it's awfully elegant to think about each one of those independently for sure, but combining them to both tamp down the kicking off of the action potential and also the propagation, I, I just think is biologically elegant. Perfect. So uh, one question we have is, uh, uh, once you do all that hard work to get to approval, the next step is really uh, penetrating into those patient communities, not just in the US, but across the world. Uh, for sickle cell, for example, where it's obviously such a prominent disease across the world, how has Vertex set up uh, its centers in the US and across the world to really reach uh, these patients? Yeah. So Vertex is a global company, but because of the genetic footprint of cystic fibrosis, what is, that has meant historically is it's a company in Northern and Western Europe, in Australia, New Zealand, and in the Americas. We actually haven't had a large presence in the rest of the world. CF is not only a genetic disease, but it has a founder effect, which is why it's found in Northern Western Europe and where people from those areas migrated. Uh, as an example for our expansion, there's actually a lot of sickle cell disease and beta thalassemia in the Middle East. And in October of last year, we uh, opened our first offices in the Middle East in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to reach the patients there. As we think about where um, sickle cell disease is very prominent, it's on the continent of Africa. And we are working very, very hard on a small molecule approach for sickle cell disease because I think that's the real possibility to get a medicine broadly um, to Asia where there's a lot of beta-thal and to Africa where there's a lot of sickle cell disease. I think it's difficult to imagine that a medicine like Kaschevi with the intensive period of time that is needed when you condition with busulfan that that would be um, widely possible um, on the continent of Africa. So uh, our thought there is to make sure we um, invent and then bring to um, Africa, for example, the small molecule approach. Great. So Reshma, you've come from the uh, academic medical center and now obviously you're at the head of Vertex. Uh, what's your experience been in terms of Vertex interacting with academic centers uh, in terms of innovation and uh, early stage work? You know, I think as with most um, things, uh, most complex things, pendulums swing one way and then pendulums swing the other way. Uh, I think we've reached a, a very good place in the way not only Vertex but biopharma companies work with the entire ecosystem, with big pharma and small startups, with venture capital, with uh, government and policymakers, academics, and certainly the hospital system. Uh, th there are times where this pendulum swing has been such that um, maybe academia and uh, companies stayed further apart from each other than was maybe best for the patients. But where I see it now and where I see Vertex and uh, certainly the, the centers here in Boston, we have very uh, good uh, arrangements, collaborations, interactions with labs where basic science is emerging. Much of the Kaschevi sickle cell beta thal story started in labs right here in Boston at Children's Hospital and Stu Orkin's group, and, and that's fantastic to see. 
I also see it in the later stages of development where when we're doing clinical trials, whether it's in CF or type 1 diabetes, um, that is also done right here in the Commonwealth. The first, um, I, I won't tell you exactly which patient it was, but in the um, type 1 diabetes cell-based program, um, one of the first patients um, that received the therapy received it right here in the Commonwealth um, at the Mass General Hospital. So it's really terrific to see everything from early stage discovery all the way through clinical trials. Rashpal, that's the end of our time, and thank you so much for spending an extra half an hour with us. Thank, thank you. you.